Okay. Welcome to the Anoikis Connection, Episode 3. Uh, my name is Tiberius, and I am the host. Uh, I first want to let everybody know uh, right off the bat uh, that the reason that my voice is sounding so raspy and it's the very same reason that uh, I've not been able to make content as of late for uh, TIS. Um, I am currently recovering from throat and thyroid cancer. Um, and I am expected to make a full recovery. Um, I appreciate any sympathy and well wishes that you guys have for me and look forward to when I'm recovered enough to continue producing enough content, bringing you stories from J-Space and now inherently Trig Space. But with the recent release of the brand new area of Trig Space, I decided to take some time out of recovery to uh, bring as the best information that I can and as much information as I can to uh, you guys. Um, so, and boy, do we have a juggernaut light up here with us. Um, so first off, we have uh, the spiritual creator of this show. Um, he is the former CSM uh, representative for JSpace and CSM 15 candidate. Um, he is the creator of the Praise Bob Discord for Wormholers. Um, he is the CEO of TDSEN, now a member of the Initiative Alliance, and previously a long-standing member of the JSpace community, and extremely knowledgeable of the JSpace ecosystem. Ixuki, thanks for joining us today. Is he here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay. Thanks for having me. Uh, next up, we have the CEO of the Kybernaut. Uh, Kybernauts and one of the lead organizers during the final chapter of the Dreglavian invasion. Ashtarathi, thanks for coming on. Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashtarathi. It's good to be here. Uh, next up, we have Laura Seco, uh, who was a CSM 15 candidate, a well known public representative of Wormhole Space. He's a fleet commander and organizer of Hard Knock citizens who currently reside in a Class 5 Static 5 system. Hi, Lorseco. Thanks for coming back. Hi, thank you for having me. Next up is the CEO of Streebolg Clade, a lesser known but larger Triglavian group now operating inside of Trig Space. Uh, he's well versed in the mechanics of wormholes, the invasion, and the newest content through uh, the connected Trig Space. Um, Maldavius, did I pronounce that right? Maldavius? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, Maldavius, nice thanks for coming on. <laughs> Absolutely. Look forward to talking to you all. And finally, uh, we have long standing and well respected theory crafter from the J Space community. He is the current manager of the Praise Bob Discord for Wormholers um, and fleet commander for dead terrorists who reside in a 2 5 null. Uh, welcome back, Captator. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me again. So, um, first things first, um, I want to go around the room here and kind of get everyone's first impressions as to the finality of the Triglavian space. Um, Ixuki, I'd actually like to start with you. You're, uh, you have um, kind of been looking at this from the outside in. I don't know if you've participated in it, if you have any experience with it personally. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on it. You're saying that our voices are too low. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me see what's going on here. All right, let's give it a shot now. Check, check. Yep. Can you guys hear us now? Hi. We'll check before I start rambling. Yeah. Um, am I quiet? This, this, that's probably a good thing. I might send you to Lampton at some point. Still too low. Wow, what the hell's going on? I mean, I'm, I'm, on, a, I'm on a different mic. I mean, so. Yeah, my stuff is set up normal, so it might be on your end, unfortunately. Well, if he's saying everyone else is quiet, then it sounds like it's your OBS because you're, you know, your internal mic and everything you're hearing are two different channels. Yeah, uh, I'm turning everybody up right now. I think it's Discord. I had everyone set to manual levels. Rip. Yep. Yeah. 
Live technical support. Go, go. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Chat's, chat's like looking Twitch, a bit more optimistic. Dude. Hey. <laughs> there we go. Is that, uh, that better right. at me as well? All right. How many hey. tips partners does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. So, um, on to Ixuki. Sorry. Um, Ixuki, curious um, to know what your thoughts yeah. are. So, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been avidly following most of the lore uh, movement ever since they really started introducing the Trig, uh, the Trig storyline. Um, I've participated a little bit, uh, both on my main and on some, uh, some, you know, alt characters to play around with uh, some of the systems. I, I can't claim any significant uh, contributions to either side of the war effort besides tagging along on some fleets that were there or just buzzing around to go see what's going on myself um in some of the places but uh you know been watching and i think i'm sure i'll be the first of one of many people to probably say uh you know i've been watching with building uh expectations as as the summer and you know the the, uh, the system started going and um I had guesses of where the whole thing was going to go, and I guess I could say it, it went there, but uh, it's not quite what I was uh, hoping for, and I'm sure that uh, that's probably a pretty common sentiment here. Yeah, that seems to be um, pretty common sentiment. Um, Laura Seco, you've actually spent quite a bit of time in Trick Space. Um, I, you actually wrote a very a uh, long and detailed article on Reddit, um, kind of detailing your experiences with it. Kind of seemed like you also were a little disappointed in terms of uh, how it turned out, at least to the layman. So yeah, the way I play Eve is in, as far as I'm concerned in my Eve story, the main the main characters are the players. I don't really, I don't really care about the NPC interactions. They're just a means to an end of making more player spaceships explode. So I wasn't interested at all in the war. The potential that I saw in Trick Space was somewhere new for players to explore and then to manipulate new mechanics in order to make more explosions, essentially. And I was disappointed with the outcome because I was, I was expecting some sort of cross between Thera and NPC Nalsec, somewhere that players would be able to live into and to take advantage of mechanics to uh, to essentially allow small groups to thrive and to, and, to, and to hinder large groups trying to live in this area of space. That's what I was expecting. And the reality is something a lot more sort of dangerous. It's a dangerous place to live, but it's that's because of the NPCs and not because of the potential for other players to cause damage, which I don't think is in the spirit of Eve. So yeah, I am I'm quite disappointed with what I've seen so far. Um, Ashtarathi, how uh, has the how is the um, expansion now that you guys have had an opportunity to look at it? How has that kind of translated into like what your expectations were before the final expansion came compared to now? Well, uh, ultimately, we only had kind of guesses as to what was going to happen. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody publicly had like exactly this situation kind of sussed out until about 48 hours, 24 hours ahead of time. Um, although we all knew that, of course, the liminals would be important and would be somehow combined together. We are also not 100% sure whether or not it's fully rolled out. Um, one thing that's important to remember is that invasions, uh, each previous phase rolled out over the course of several weeks. Um, even chapter one was over was about a month from the release of invasions to the first time we ever saw the world arc with it increasing in complexity every single week. Um, and CCP really likes this idea of like stage rollouts and feeling a little bit more alive as as things happen. And to that point, inside of each of the home systems, there are gates that are conspicuously left off, and they bring points to this, implying that that there could be some deeper stage. So we really don't know a hundred percent what we're looking with at, but as we're interpreting the grand scope of things, we're actually seeing a lot of potential for an organization that uh, builds itself around living in these environments to be able to have long-term success, even though uh, the, the present term occupation is, uh, is a, a lot of challenges. Yeah, we're doing basically the same thing as well over in Strabog is trying to figure out how to live in this space for when it is all fully implemented. Because there's a number of things here that they don't feel like they're quite there yet. You know, there's clearly something more that's coming. 
So our entire idea right now is just get everybody standings, make sure that everybody gets in, hold the space, and wait for it all to come through. Excuse me, my microphone is off. Captator, you've been kind of viewing this more as a spectator sport, uh, more than um, actively participating in it. Um, as the invasion has kind of progressed over the past like um, month or two or so, um, you know, would you say that this is kind of along the lines of your expectations? Do you feel kind of disappointed for it? Uh, what What are your general thoughts for it? I mean, first of all, I think like law wise it's been super cool like even from the sidelines just seeing people kind of get involved in the slow progression of the like escalating tensions between uh even common trig and how that's been spilling out into the conflict and how that's been spilling out from the npc side into the player community and, you know some of the adaptive tactics and stuff it's it's kind of cool to see and particularly see that kind of stuff in high sec where you know uh largely there isn't so much of that kind of thing going on um in terms of like where we are now um i think like my my thinking on what this could be when i saw the like the the software uh, what's it the like the sde uh, like leak and we had that first map of the the 27 systems in the triangle um i was thinking that um, it would kind of be like a, a thera that multiple groups could live in, you know, so you have the each each clade could have its own subpopulation of player groups, so they could have like internal conflict between clades, but then you've also got all of the external connectivity that um, maybe allows uh, blops or, you know, more um, more play that looks like the kind of null static gameplay that uh, that my group does. Gotcha. Okay. And we don't quite this actually, seem to be there yet. This is actually a good example of one of those things that that what we have doesn't quite make sense, and therefore suggests that maybe that hopefully it implies that they are going to iterate on these things, because uh, progression in Poshvin is standings based. It, it's um, from you know point, negative point five in order to even dock to 1.0 for fittings. But what's interesting to me is it's what 4.0, no 3.0, for clone bay, but yet med clones are not a thing. So it's like it's higher than docking, fitting, and repair. It's like second only to uh, being able to do industry and navigate. But really, all it does is allow you to jump between to another jump clone in the same system or station. That seems really confusing. So. Hopefully they'll iterate on that and make it so that that high standings clone bay access comes with a med clone capability. So kind of going off what you were talking about there though, Cap, um, we did want that. So a number of the players that moved in into these systems, we've actually got people down to the south and one of the other clades. Our plan was to lock down all of the space and then do provings, which is we fight against each other as frenemies. So like along with what you were saying there, that is how we thought it was going to play out as well. And we really, really want that. I mean, the, just just to say on the standings thing that um, like a lot of the people that I knew who were kind of keen to to like get involved, who maybe hadn't been so involved in sort of PVE stuff at the start, um, those standings are like a hard wall. They're just like, right, okay, this, I'm just gonna wait and leave this for several months and see what if anything happens. I would I would have thought a a way of giving a similar effect um, without being forcing people as it were to engage in, in in pve if that's really not their gameplay style would be maybe to have um services tied behind items that one can get from pve so then you have a like an indirect market where i say a player who hasn't done the pve and isn't interested in engaging in it could buy um you know a, a particular part that drops from a, you know, a, a drifter or um, or a rogue drone that a PVE player has uh, has looted in their in their play, and then that is what I can trade in to be able to put industry jobs on or put a clone in or something. You know, so there's so like, like a, there's an intermediary market. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. Yeah. There's an issue with that though, which is it kind of counters what I believe to be kind of the core design of what they're going for here, which is that 
um, effectively this standings grind, uh, which I want to point out is like totally broken right now. And CCP has even said so. And so I expect to see more clarifications and more refinements of the, of the standings process, uh, in the next, you know, weeks or so. But, um, the point is, is that having a standings grind like that as a buy-in, uh, functions as, as a, well, as a buy-in, right? So anybody who wants to be part of the organization has to work up their ranks in this sort of way, which goes back to the fact that in a lot of ways, invasions have sort of ended up being that, uh, you know, faction warfare 2.0, that idea where the people that are part of that organization are part of that organization because they've bought into this idea that they work for the Triglavian's efforts. You know, they, they, if you, your job is to roam around Poshvin and and kill things that are coming out of wormholes and and de destroy the enemies of the Triglavians, and that's what you get your rewards for. And if that isn't what you want to do in your life, then that then that isn't the content for you. Let's take a step back here for a second. Um, you said that the the standings gain was broken, and that CCP even said so. Could you expand on that and kind of like explain why or how it, it is that happened? Because it seemed to have that kind of seemed to have like happened overnight on a lot of respects, and there's a lot of differencing difference of opinions on that. And I would like to kind of see what everyone's take is on that. So there was an exploit. Um, the exploit was that you could hit certain drone structures. Those would give you negative 1.2 to rogue drones, and then that would give you a derived standing to the um, you know Triglavian. So it was a massive amount of standing gain larger than anything else we ever saw in the game. The exploit was that you could warp out of the system, warp back into the system and kill another structure, keep doing that over and over again. And people were able to get to 3.0 standings in under an hour. The people who have been doing this content, it took us four, five months to get there. Like it is wildly difficult to, to grind these because on a 12 minute tick, you get 0 0.002 on average. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at every 12 minute tick, it takes you 12.5 days to reach 3.0. And they were doing it under an hour because of this issue. So that's where the thing broke. And that's where CCP said, hey, this is broken. Don't do this. This is an exploit. Right. So there's three different things going on, basically. One is that there are some things that are literally just broken, right? So rogue drones were giving huge amounts of standings when they weren't supposed to, which was causing confusion. But also, um, as Mal can probably tell about, there's the other side of the coin where there's a site that's supposed to give you massive Triglavian standings that instead cuts your Triglavian standings by a yeah. huge amount, um, which, is admit which has been identified as a bug. So flashpoint, you, nobody should run Triglavian flashpoints inside of Poshvin right now because yep. you will totally screw yourself. So to give uh, you an example of that, it gives you negative 0 0.24. <laughs> with yeah, talk about what happened to your fleet, because that's so, that's something that people don't really yeah, think about. We had about a we had a, a about a 20 man fleet. We were some of the first people to do it. I don't know if we were the first or not, but I, I know we're some of the first because no one spread this. We get into the site, we kill the dread knot, just like we normally do for all the dread sites. If anyone's done any trade content on it, you kill a dread. Then you fly up to this pylon that doubles everyone's damage and you kill a structure while a massive Zernitra is there killing it with you. We killed the structure, nothing happened. No payout. The site didn't spawn a cache like it normally does. And we just went, oh, that's weird. And we went to start flying home. Then everyone lost 0 0.24 standing in our whole fleet. Some of those people dropped under 3.0, meaning they could no longer use the gates and they were stuck in that Poshvin system. Like they got completely owned. And the funny thing is, is the standing stick says that it's the Triglavian, like, I forget what it is, it's like Triglavian Group's uh, Concord Stellar Observatory was destroyed. So, like, they own a Concord structure now. It's just very strange, like, really weird bugs like that. So we did have to deal with that. And if you look at the way that the standings work, that is a full 24-hour period of farming at the current rate, 12 minutes on every tick for 24 hours to get that standing back. But, on the other hand, if you think about that working, like, say, if you did that next week, assuming that the only thing that's wrong about that is that it was assigned to the wrong side, then that would be a huge standings buff. And and so just running a couple of those sites for people would give them the standings that they need. In addition mm -hmm. to that, there are some things that are a little bit more confusing, right? So the lack of sites in Eden Com Minor Victories and Fortresses, one of the things that happened was the sites themselves seemingly disappeared. Now, 
they do still spawn. Forward posts still spawn, field bases still spawn, emerging conduits still spawn. I've, see, I, I've physically seen all three of those, but they're way more rare. And I think that they probably function on some sort of like anomaly where if you run one on one in one site, it'll respawn in one of the other minor victories or something. Uh, so that way you have to chase them around. Either way, they're super inconsistent now. And so people can't run that for standings anymore. So the primary method that people had for standings even went away, which leaves what was technically before the best way to get standings outside of doing the dread sites, which is hunting down orcas. The orcas and the uh, Daz uh, equivalents, the uh, Triglavian equivalents, um, give a bigger standings. It's 0, 1, 5, 0, 1, 2, I think it is. 0, 0, 1, 3. Yeah, so 0. 0. 0, 0, 0.013. 0. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is, so that's like four or five normal sites put together in one in one rat. Two problems with that. Yeah. One, the response fleet uh, is actually attached to the wrong group. They're attached to the corporation Aegis, which is under Edencom, which doesn't have a derived standings with Triglavian. So killing the support fleet doesn't actually give you the correct standings, yep. although the Orca does. But more importantly, uh, the Orcas now tend to cluster inside of the stellar observatories, uh, uh, launch sites inside of the minor victories and the fortresses, which is nestled behind a, a T1 cruiser uh, gate and is surrounded by like up to 50 rats. So in battleships. Yeah, yeah, yeah in battleships. <laughs> So uh, we haven't quite figured out how to deal with that yet. Um, but so like the way to get standings is is incredibly not straightforward right now. Um, and so there was a third one, but I can't think of it right now. Yeah, so, so yeah, what we've done to circumvent that, the, the way that we've done to adapt to it is we have two contingencies. We have a group of people that live in Poshvin that have 3.0 or higher. And we have a group of people that live in K-Space out near a bunch of Edencom fortresses to farm out those orcas. Inside of Poshvin, we're killing drifters. The drifters are horrifying, but they do give standings through derived standings. It's not a lot, but it's enough to keep us in there. And then the people in K-Space are trying to hunt orcas by attacking gun stars and spawning them in. It's not optimal, and there really doesn't seem to be a way forward. Our expectation was that there would be something like, um, you know, agents or missions or something internally where we can keep aligning ourselves with, you know, Triglavians in some way. But there doesn't seem to be a, a really good gameplay path forward here. Laura Seco, um, kind of uh, winding back a little bit here, um, you wrote, uh, again, you wrote the a very long, um, detailed article about uh, the Treglavian expansion and stuff like that, and one of the things that you mentioned was you felt like it was poor game design to kind of lock uh, the region behind uh, the standings thing. Um, I was curious uh, if you'd like to expand on that and kind of uh, explain why your thought process is on that. Sure. So something that Ashitothi just said was that he said that uh, you're committing to the cause by joining the Triglavians and you should be grinding standings with them if you want to live in that area of space. And he made the comparison to faction warfare. I think that comparison is kind of disingenuous because if I join a faction warfare corp, then sure, I make the commitment to start with and then I can't enter say Kaldari MR space, for example, if I join the Galente faction warfare, but I don't have to grind standings to then just operate in my own area of space. I don't even have to run the sites, I can just go in PvP. There's no there's no oh. consequence to not doing that. I, I agree, and I'm, I, I guess I didn't finish that thought. Uh, the point is, is that uh, this becomes a barrier for entry, such that once you've made it in, you know that the other people that are in there have also made that commitment, right? So there's a mutual buy-in buy -in to all, all those who have made it within the 3.0 and then later on to the 7.0 like tiers. And sure, other people can come in, but no one can maneuver in it. Nobody, no, nobody has the home field advantage, like those who have actually gone through the process of like aligning themselves with the flow of Virage, as it were. The barrier for so, entry there just seems completely absurd. It's such a high bar. Even if they were to, even if they were to fix it so it didn't need 12 days of 24 hours a day standing, and it took a more reasonable amount of time, there's only so much PVE that certain players would want to do to enter this barrier of space. And I appreciate that you guys are willing to put in the work to get through that grind, but this has been who knows how many hours of death work, and to have it be reserved for such an exclusive group of players that are the right combination of willing so, to do the grind for the PVE and willing to willing to live in Nullsec. I totally understand why you guys are on board with that, but for the rest of us who were looking for a new region of space to explore, we felt kind of left out here, especially with the amount of dev time that's been diverted from elsewhere to go into this. 
I think so it's also actually a circumvention to that, though. And the circumvention is that all of these systems have roaming wormholes. You don't need standing to use those. So people but do we can get onto the systems. Horrific mechanics of using those wormholes later. We I talked know. about it a bit before the show, but at the end of the day, being yeah, able to use rough. those wormholes is, is not, it does not make up for it. Yeah, let's, it really uh, does. filaments too. Try to stay on yeah, track here. Exo, you said you, yeah, you were trying to chime in there. Um, well, I guess I, I was just going to, you know, offer my perspective that I think the last thing Eve needs is content that is severely gated um almost everything else in eve is a like you can immediately dip your toes and if you want you might be terrible at it you know outside of ships being behind actual skill locks the moment you start the game you technically can go get into virtually every part of the game you want uh, you know your success very heavily um i think they've kind of gone possibly the wrong direction with how they've kind of built up some of this space but i also recognize that we could also sit and i'd love to imagine that they're not quite done and there's still both there's a lot to do and maybe some of the stuff that they've shipped wasn't quite uh tuned right um but actually i think there might be a way that you know in terms of current game mechanics right like we have the whole system of if you don't have enough standings when we talk about faction warfare right when you enter their space you can't just not use the gates. They actually will hunt you down and try to kill you. I'm surprised that CCP didn't go with a system somewhat like that, where if you don't have 3.0 standing in these systems, the trigs send people to come kill you. And if you don't have 7.0 in the higher systems, they send people to come kill you. If you're fast enough, if you're skilled enough, you should be able to move around this space just in the same way, but the gates actually don't work, which is odd to me. So I do I like agree that with that. That's a good idea. The, yeah. the thing that disrupts yeah. it for me okay. is that the rats can move between the gates. That's what bugs me. Why Why can the drifters move between gates if players without enough stand... How can they lock out players with standings without being able to lock out drifters or oh, even Oh, that's Kong? interesting. Th their jump tech's just way better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, so Edencom should share some tech, man. Captain, yeah, are you trying to chime in there? I was, I was going to say, I think that, like, particularly locking Stargates behind PvE is not sensible design. Um, that said, I could also quite easily see having to hack the gate, for example, um, as an acceptable intermediary way. It's not quite like if you're running away from someone, you've got to kind of factor in the time where I've got to hack this gate open because I don't actually have the access. Um, I like that. I think that would be another like in-between uh, thing where someone who is of correct standings can just hit the gate and go, right, off I go. And someone who isn't maybe has to kind of factor that time. They have to be a bit more careful about how they approach gates. So they're not then hard stuck in a system, which is kind of what you currently are. Like you filament in, if you don't have a filament out, you're stuck. If you don't have a wormhole out, you're stuck. Um, you Allowing know. people to use, ha to hack the gates is by far the most exciting thing I've heard in the last week. That would be amazing. I, I support anything that makes more use for the data analyzer. Yeah, that would be an interesting uh, take on that. You know, if you, in order for you to get there, you need to move stuff around. And that would also imply that you would have to have certain types of, you would have to understand how to manipulate the NPCs in order to get them to move off the gate, in order to try to get the gate on, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of opens avenues for um, player agency. Yeah, I just you, I just love the idea that like the invading fleet lands and like kills everything and bring in the code cracker and like the guy comes in and like has to start hacking the gate while everybody's fighting every yeah. I, man I want it. I like so, that or so I like the idea of it being it. faction warfare. Both of those work really well compared to the current system. I think you, you know how the um, the acceleration gates work, where the person who has the key, or in this case has hacked the gate, like hacks the gate. And then you have like a time window where anyone can use the gate and then the gate goes back to okay now you need the key again um i think what you could build in with the other npc factions is then okay right but the drifters are at the trig gate and they're gonna have to sit there for a bit and they're gonna have to hack the gate to then go through and so as a player then you could kind of take that risk of okay well when the drifters have hacked the gate i can also take it but then i have drifters like on the landing and on the the exit so you've got like levels of risk that the player can engage in depending on how desperate they are to get through that gate. That's how I do it. 
I do like those types of mechanics. I think that there needs to be some kind of extra gameplay in a lot of these different areas. Because anytime you go to something in a game and it just says no, there's and there's no counterplay, that's where it starts to feel really odd for me. Like, I've yeah. been in the gaming industry for about 13 years myself, so I've worked at major studios, own my own game studio now, been in this for a long time, and any time that a player is up against a brick wall with no counterplay, it is not fun for them. And I'm, I'm noticing that a lot in some of this content right now, and I'm hoping that it evolves. I also want to take a step back just for everybody um, who may not be familiar with what's going on. Um, for a lot of the information about Triglavian space right now, you can open up your agency window and go to the exploration tab. There's now a new, I think, fifth b button, which is Triglavian invasions. There you can see your standings. You can see what all your standings um, will control. And you can see what kinds of filaments uh, are available into and out of Poshfin. Yeah, those filaments in also bypass the standing system, but once you're in, you can't use the gates, so you're locked into whatever system it throws you into. So on, that, on that topic, actually, um, I would actually like to take an opportunity to kind of do some uh, rumor control, because obviously with this expansion, there's been quite a bit of misinformation that's kind of passed around. So um, I would actually like... Um, um, either of you guys to possibly, you know, talk about some rumors and stuff. So first of all, I have a personal question. Um, what is the deal with uh, structures? Uh, are structure anchoring? Can you anchor structures in trick space? Is it locked nope. behind? No. Wow. Okay. So the citadels that exist now, we've actually got quite a lot of them. We have six systems with citadels down in them. These are the only ones that will ever exist. You also can't bring Titans into the system. You also can't build Titans. We have an Asbel down, we tried to build them, and the game just says no. It's literally, you cannot build them here. You cannot bring them in. All of the wormhole connections that we've mapped, we've mapped every type of wormhole that can possibly enter or exit here. None of them have the mass requirement allowed for a uh, capital either. So the citadels that are here are the only ones that will ever exist. The capitals that made it in before the shift are the only ones that will ever exist. And no to other ones to clarify, can be in here. To clarify, you can't build any capitals. Correct. You, you said Titan, I think. So, but yeah, no capital construction capitals. whatsoever. Can, um, yeah, guys, there's no uh, capitals allowed at all. Do you guys yeah. have any speculation as to why they didn't allow citadels inside of uh, Trick Space? So that is weird. I don't know why they wouldn't allow s new citadels. I mean, I guess it's to prevent additional people from coming in and populating the space and overthrowing the people that worked for the standings. That seems kind of likely to me, but for the capitals thing, it's a little bit odd because some of these systems were low sec before. In fact, Nalvula has three titans in it. They're sitting in there, owned by someone, and one of them's called the Dragon of Nalvula. It's terrifying. So there but are titans in there. in there. Yeah, there are titans right. in here. They do exist there was, inside yeah, of this Anything space. that was in there. Do you know what kind of titans are in there? Uh, there was a Ragnarok that we saw, and an Erebus, for sure. And I know there's a third one that people have been talking about, but we're waiting to confirm. I just want to respond out. to your speculation there, that uh, potentially structures aren't allowed to be anchored there to as, as almost an indirect reward to the people who ground the standings and they've already set up in there. That seems a little weird, because what's this area of space going to look like in five years when potentially your groups are, are, are oh, dead yeah. or have moved elsewhere and those structures are all destroyed? It, it just... That, that sort of attrition where nobody can move into a place just sort of makes well, it no, seem like they just don't want any structures yeah. in there at all I mean, at the, the end of the day and don't they, have a I clean mean, way of removing at, your structures. Do you, the expectation do you is clearly... CCB, do you actually I, believe that CCB wanted us to move into wormholes and fortify them in the way that they did? Do you think they wanted keep stars to be in wormholes? Because that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. I mean, if, if they didn't want that to happen, maybe this is the evolution of it. Maybe they, they're testing that. You know, they absolutely did because there was a lot of fuss when Keepstars were first announced, and CCP chose to allow them in wormholes, so they did. Oh, well, there you and go. at the end of the yeah. day, ultimately, like CCP definitely had a certain vision for wormholes in 2009, but what we've evolved it into is better because CCP in 2013, 2014, at least shattered wormholes and gave them mechanics where you couldn't live in them, and essentially turned them into what they expected wormholes to be in 2009. Have you heard of any epic stories from shattered wormholes? Like there's been a couple of cap ganks in there, but they're not they're not the content creation systems that wormhole spaces come to become. Frankly, yeah. in my opinion, comparing the Wild West vision of wormhole spaces CCP had to the empire building metagaming reality, what we have evolved wormhole space into is better than what it, what it would have been had nobody moved in there in the first place, certainly. 
So Still the thing is, is when, want... when this space first released, we actually had a number of static wormholes. It was a bug, they did fix it, but the way that we saw it at that time was that it worked as an, an like a, basically a hyperspace highway, right? You hop into one system of Poshvin, you move one system over, and you're the other side of New Eden in one go. It was really interesting because they were, you know, definable. You knew where you could get to, and that made this space unique and fun and cool, even with no structures in it. So. It, it makes me wonder if they were shooting for something to make it unique in terms of transport rather than in terms of living in it. And basically, we're living in it because we're insane at this point. Like, it's it's rough in here. Yeah. If that's how they intended, that well, just sounds two so things, boring. There's like, two I things to point out. First of all, the, the, the expectation is clearly that we live in their structure, in their stations. There are, there are Triglavian NPC stations that require increasing amount of standings in order to use the services they're in. So if I could just anchor an Astrohus and throw in a clone bay, then the entire point of grinding enough to get the standings to have a, to use the Triglavian's clone bay would be moot. If I could just drop a Raitaru and throw in an industry rig, then the getting the 4.0 to use the industry of the of the structures would be moot. The point is is that people who have gotten 7.0 standings will be able to operate within home systems and will be more protected than than elsewhere and still have a, and access to all of the services as and, and they can leverage the territory. Again, this is about a home field advantage. So like, it's just a little bit more access to people that are able to be, to get through the standings. But if, if people could just anchor structures or do these other things, then that would undermine that effort. Well, I we can agree to exactly disagree. It. Hold on uh, I mean, I, go, I on. Think, no, go ahead, Exa. I think the, the reasoning behind some of those decisions, I think you were kind of exactly right. Uh, I think CCP has learned from I, I, mistakes is not the right word, but they've learned from wormhole space when it comes to they have a vision, they throw some stuff out there, and then the players end up creating something. And what they do know for a fact is once the players are already doing something, it's considerably harder to stop. You know, we've, we've heard every so often, oh, people weren't supposed to live in wormholes. You know, some of the devs will also say they wish to they wish to the very end that caps had never been allowed in wormholes because of how much the complication to, to balancing. And so what I'm seeing and I'm guessing is some of the stuff, no capitals, you know, no structures. It's about putting um it's it's about putting like uh you know edges to the to the to their plan so that they can make sure that we don't get too far off of their plan because it's a lot easier for them to one day go you know what people can go put structures down than it is for them to deal with having to to rip them up and of course you know because they used existing systems rather than creating 27 entire new ones there's some overlap and it's it's not quite perfect but uh, my suspicion as to why both there's no capitals no new capitals able to be introduced and why people can't go dropping structures down everywhere is because uh it's easier for them to keep the space guided into what their vision is if they can uh you know uh, minimize the kind of places that uh, players can run off on um i think it was their intention to kind of create this uh, either subcap only or almost entirely subcap kind of realm uh, they've hinted at it a couple times over the last couple of years. You know, there's been people for years complaining about capital ship balance or proliferation and saying, please, CCP, give us a place for only subcaps. So I also see that as potentially one of the directions that they were trying to go here. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what their, their long term plan is, but they've created this space where people are fighting and they're more or less limited to using subcaps. And um, frankly, I love that. I actually really love that. Throughout the entire invasion, when we were invading stars that went final liminality, even though they were technically null sec, if they were originally a high sec system, it was subcaps only. So it follows that trend. And it was a great feeling not having to worry about a capital fleet running in on a whole bunch of new players. Because a lot of this brought new players into the game. People who had never done anything in EVE before. People who were just, you know, only lived in high sec their whole lives. You know, a bunch of Care Bear people only mining all the time. And now they're out there in null sec space fighting for, like, the Triglavians out there PvPing in a, a wild roam. This stuff they'd never done before. And this space mimics that, where it's subcaps only. And I do really like that it's subcaps only. I don't want capitals here because it's much more fun this way and it's much more accessible to play. It, it also I, kind I also of wanna... helps set it up so that, you know, like it's, it's much harder for this space to be significantly interfered with by 
you know, other powers that be. Uh, I won't claim it's impossible, uh, but I think it's hard enough that it's, it's, it's they've, you know, because C- as CCP builds this new space, I'm sure one of the things some of the devs kind of get concerned about is, well, what's to stop you know, giant powerful group here from just claiming this space as their own and, you know, uh, and and we've done nothing to help or add to the game's political diversity. Uh, The space is built in a manner that the people that choose to live there, uh, at least, you know, I'd like to imagine once they fix some of the issues they're having with standings in the sites and the rats shooting you when they probably shouldn't be, that the people that live there have kind of uh, their own kind of edge. And it's very unlikely that you're going to see one of the already existing power groups just slide over and say, this is our space now because of the way that you move in and out, the way that, you know, they can't project, uh, you know, so, so, uh, their massive numbers or their massive cap fleets because of it so uh i'm speculating that that's at least some of the reason behind some of these decisions as well as the space has created a new niche and a new opportunity for i mean groups that we have right here on this call to you know build up an entire new corporation alliance political you know community and just kind of build it up with limited interference from other parts of the game that depending on who you ask the, you know, some people will say this group is ruining the game. That group's ruining the game. They can't argue, at least, that those groups are ruining Drake's face. True, and I, I think uh, the cool thing is, is we kind of yeah. act like Vikings, where we can find a wormhole out, dump a bunch of trigs into that space, raid, and then get back into Poshman and you know get away. And I think that's a cool uh, gameplay mechanic. That's 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 my gameplay. Get away from my gameplay. Yeah, we already uh, have that gameplay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's we just literally too. my it's gameplay. Ours now too. <laughs> well, I just wanted to. I just wanted to chip in on something you said earlier, Maldavius, uh, which I think is important, and I think um, sure. bears bears uh, like a little more pointing out that one of the big problems in terms of how Eve PVE and PvP has been structured historically is that. Um, the, the context and the fits and the ships that you choose and how you use them and whether you need to group up etc have all been very very different between those two domains and I think one of the um, the really positive aspects of this entire invasion arc um, has been to um, better bridge between those two spaces um, and I think that, that that is something that CCP should be lauded for because it, that is a at least looking at it, before the invasion content that is a very large gap and quite a, a gnarly problem to try and design your way across so i agree on, i on think that, that it's uh, something that oh go for no, it. uh go finish your thought yeah i was going to say i think it's actually something that is superb game design i have not seen an event that works in this way that brings so many players from different backgrounds together we get people from like hardcore old school nullsec people you get people like me that have been playing since 2007 doing all this kind of stuff and then a person's first day in the game all going into a null sex system and working together that is so good for bringing new players and it's so good for getting them to work together and experience new things in eve and like learn about what it is to play eve and i i've never seen anything like that and the invasion content did it the problem that i'm seeing with posture right now is it's the opposite it's exclusionary and there's nothing that we can do to work with those people anymore so i'm hoping there's more of that uh so on a kind of leapfrogging off of what cap says uh, so let's actually discuss uh, the Poshvin trends for um, how to, to get in and out of uh, Trig Space, which is Poshvin. Yeah. Um, so first, actually, I would like to touch on um, kind of going back to rumor control. Can you guys describe uh, what filaments are, what is required in order for them to happen, and uh, you know, so on and so forth? If you could describe the mechanics to it, I would appreciate it. Sure. Filaments actually drop off of the Edencom and Triglavian rats. We actually haven't gotten any off of Dreads, maybe, or, or not Dreads, sorry, off of uh, Drifters. Maybe you guys have, Ash? I'm not sure. We've, the we've only gotten them by farming Edencom. I, I've okay. requested people to try it by uh, going after Trigs, the pro Edencom guys. So far, the pro Edencom guys who are mostly running the Dread site have not reported getting any. Okay, so you get them off of them, they're a pretty rare drop. They're actually absurdly rare, much more so than you would think, because when people run normal filaments, like, you know, gamma filaments and all that kind of stuff, you just get a ton of these filament pieces. You don't get that from these. We're talking, like, hundreds of ships to maybe get one, you know? 
And when you use it, there's different kinds. So some of them will send you to a certain cry, like one of our different sections, our clade of, you know, Velus. It will send you to that side of the triangle. One will send you to anywhere in Poshvin. One will send you to one of the home systems in Poshvin that normally take, you know, a 7.0. And they go 5, 10, and 15, like normal, you know, yeet filaments do that send you out into nullsec space. So they work the same way. And then we have ones from the inside that go out. And these are really interesting because the ones that go from inside to out, you have two kinds. One of them sends you to any minor victory system in the game that was minor victory for Triglavian. Triglavian minor victory. Yeah, and that is very cool. That's really interesting. And the other one is it sends you geographically to a nearby system from where that system in Pochvin used to be on the map. Both of these are quite cool. Like they, they do some really interesting things and you can get a raiding fleet together, do that, yeet out into K-Space, do a bunch of damage and then yeet back into Poshvin. And it's just, I like it. I like that system. I just wish they would drop more. They're so rare right now. There's two things about these keys that I find absolutely amazing. First of all, these extraction ones, which are the proximity ones, it's 2.5 light years. So it can jump you to any random system that is within 2.5 light years of the system that you are in. Um, because remember, the, the systems didn't physically go anywhere. They're still there. So um, you can use what this means is you can like take a deep space transport, yeet into uh, Poshvin. If you need to, you might need to move a jump or two and then use an extraction node. And then you can appear somewhere else. In, K in New Eden, and most of these systems are in high sec. Several of them are next to the right next to the forge, or you know, Jita. Um, you know, so it it's actually going to make some pretty interesting logistics possibilities just by that alone. Um, but the thing I find fascinating personally, if I could lore nerd for a second, since the beginning of invasions, uh, when we fight Triglavians, they drop tier one abyss filaments. And this has always bothered me for a couple of reasons. Uh, mostly because it just means that I have a giant pile of tier one abyss filaments, well, five piles of tier one abyss filaments <laughs> that are growing. Like I have 500 of every single tier one abyss filament. I feel that. Just playing around. So, but it's like, why? Why, do they, why? why are they just inundating us all with these? And then I realized this is their ticket home. So now when, when Kybernauts, when pro Triglavians leave Poshvin, we're going to carry a, a filament with us to bring us back home and if you pl blow us up you'll get our filament home so yes i agree that they should be more available but they should be somehow more available to loyalists than to edencom in my opinion but yeah. i love this idea that these the mechanics of these filaments make us now behave exactly as we've watched the triglavians behave and in fact explains their behavior that's a very interesting yeah. introspect <laughs> There's actually another thing, too, is if you're inside of Poshvin, you can buy them at the NPC stations, and they're ridiculously cheap. You can only buy one type, though, and that's the one that tends you out to a minor victory out in K-Space. The problem with this is um, not every system in Poshvin has an NPC station, so if you eat into a system and you don't have the standings to get out, and there's no NPC station, you're stuck. <laughs> that being said, you do have a couple of options. There are several people with 3.0 standings that are willing to bring you a key if you need to, depending on who you trust. And I think Signal True. Cartel has an active rescue service going now. Yes, they yeah, do. We, we can always help people get out as well over at Strybog. So if you hit us up in game, we'll bring you a filament if you're on our side of the map. And that's one of the things I really like about, po like when I see Poshvin, I'm thinking about the potential that it has months and years from now, right? So each one, the fact that there are super capitals and capitals and, and structures, but there won't be any more, means that each one of these Fortizars are going to have their own story, right? Each structure is going to have its own story. Which one's going to be the last Fortizar? Which one's going to be the last Titan? You know, how many kills is a certain Titan? Who, are you going to use it or not use it? You know, this, this system has this stuff. And a lot of the people, you know, maybe a system will be occupied by people who can't easily move to other systems. So each system will be independent in some ways, but also interdependent in a lot of other ways. And again, that idea of like the home field advantage of those who have invested in their home in defending their home gain increasing p privileges within that home, I think is a really cool idea. Like, I think the principles are still there. Yeah, we've actually got a market set up in here as well. I know a number of we we worked with the other groups to make sure there was a market in each side of the triangle in each one of the clades. So we have available free ported markets set up for people once they do get the standings to get in here and enjoy it. Could I add something onto the stuff that you guys have just said quickly? 
Um, sure. I'll start with a positive one. You guys comment on the filaments. I agree with everything you've said. As much, as much as I've been super negative about this area of space, I think the filament design is pretty genius. It hinders big groups hugely and it allows small groups to thrive. Even groups as big as mine, which is only like 100 real people, we're too big to really operate properly in that area of space, which I think is a really good scale. I really think that's a genius game design on their part. Uh, the negative bit, something that Ash, told the, Ash just said, sorry, I'm terrible at name pronunciation, about four desires having their own story. It can be exciting to a point, but because there's a limited amount, what this area of space now has is an expiration date for that sort of content. So yes, it's going to be super exciting with the storied history, but then when the last four desire dies, that's the end of the story. Is that a good thing? Well, again, this content is calling for people who want to be part of the Triglavian people, right? And that's the big key here. And that's why I said it's Faction Warfare 2.0. I'm not saying that it's this the same mechanics or whatever. It bleeds into that idea. Like in Empire, you uh, have to, you get a lot of protection, but it everything kind of gets told like, this is how to do it and this is what you're supposed to do. In Empire Space, or sorry, in, in Nullsec, you have absolute freedom, but your your organization has to basically decide and do every single thing that you want because there's no inherent direction um, or, or you know infrastructure provided for you. Faction warfare, low sec has always provided this kind of middle ground where it's like I have chosen to be part of this NPC uh, exercise, right? The empire I choose to support is an NPC empire. I actually want to be in you know, supporting their efforts and all that stuff. And so from that perspective, it makes a lot of sense. And so hopefully what I hope is that Potion will increasingly be populated by people who are taking part in it specifically because they want to promote Triglavian ideology. The best way that I feel about it as well is we're defectors. We defected from like K-Space. We defected from the four factions. We escaped with their systems. We took them and made our own. And there's a lot that's to be said about that. It's quite fun in a lore perspective and quite fun in a gameplay perspective for us. I do agree that putting a time limit, you know, a, a, a death timer on these system structures is going to be pretty rough and pretty weird. Um, I hope that there's a solution for that down the road. But right now it's mostly about let's see where CCP takes it for a lot of us. We're not really thinking about the end of life for this because we know that it's probably going to change because there's so much in here that's just not ready. I do really like the station interiors. I'll just say that right now. Yeah, yeah they're quite cool. cool. <laughs> the art Indeed. team won again this patch. It's it's good stuff. Oh, yeah. The art team almost always wins every patch. Kind of easy to win as the art team in a sci-fi game. Does it look cool? Yes, you win. Oh, the thing I really like is chat that... calling us thieves. Um, you can't call us thieves because ownership is ten tenths the law, and even we own your systems. They're ours now. Look, look, you all have hundred <laughs> times more systems than us. Get over it. Any anyway, rate, so <laughs> the thing uh, I like is that they they didn't just like keep the stations. The stations have been repurposed. So not only are they now owned by the owning cry, but their actual use has been transformed into something that is akin to what it was before. Right, like. Um, uh, communications or you know medical or whatever it is right and there's a lot of interesting things from like a lore side of view a side of things like at this point we can pretty much uh, settle on the fact that porvidium is probably isogen 5 and they have a thing called a porvidium uh, cache I think it was uh, which is probably something that we should all be concerned about but I just I, regardless the thing I like is that each uh, depending on the clade it has a different banner and it shows that clade's logo and then there's also structures for the convocation of Triglav outside the struggle itself, like the the upper echelon group, and that has all three of their the group's banners, one after each other next to it, um, which is really cool. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier when it came to that third gate. In the innermost home systems is that massive, massive, massive structure called the uh, the anchorage. Actually, Uriel uh, just posted a I think a tweet earlier today that showed the size of the anchorage compared to everything. It's like twice as wide as a keep star. Um, but there, there's the three, there's two gates, one that leads to the two systems that connect to there, but then there's an inoperable gate in each one of them. And so this kind of suggests that these anchor points, these anchorages are going to tie to somewhere else, either the uh, somewhere deeper in Buyan, which is where the Triglavians come from, or possibly some like centralized system or maybe to each other between the home systems. But uh, that's what I meant by the fact that there's clear evidence that there is more to come. It's not just like wishful thinking. There are yeah. clues that are like, hey, this is something else. 
Yeah, it's uh, not just that. I've also posted a picture of our star in there, in one of our systems. That star, it's clearly not done extracting. Something is happening there, and we don't know what it is. So there's still ongoing story that's going to be happening here. They're not done transmuting the stars. They may have moved the systems, but there's there's something, you know, that they're going to do. I would like well, to, they haven't uh, moved the systems. Hold on, hold on a second, dude. I would like to try to get back on track here, because we have a, a pretty... Uh, T pretty large topic we still need to talk about here, which is the uh, the wormhole connections in and out of uh, the Triclavian space. Um, so first of all, uh, CCP has released a total of four wormhole new wormhole connections. Correct? Correct me if I'm three, wrong. Five, three, five. There's three that we have. There's three that you have, and then there's five total. Is that? Yeah, we have three that connect to Trig space now. Um, they're C729s, F216s, and U372s. They connect to LOSEC for C729s, and those are full roamings, and they have a 16-hour time span. They don't allow capital ships through them, and they have a 1, million, or 1 billion mass like value total and uh, 300 million total per jump. So they are pretty annoying to roll. That's a thing. The J space one is exactly the same statistics, and it goes, it's the F216. The null sec one is the same statistics, and it's a U372. Those all go to trig space. But the thing is, is the K162, which is the exit node, is always in Poshvin. So <laughs> you can't open them from inside of Poshvin. You have to open them from the outside in. Uh, yeah, it really reinforces the fact that that things are attacking Poshvin, right? These are, these are people, things coming from outside attacking into Poshvin. And so whenever somewhere connects to Poshvin, it actually streams out rats on both sides. On the outside, you'll get trig, and on the inside, you'll get rats related to uh, where the wormhole is connected to. Yeah, so if it goes to JSpace, you get drifters. If it goes to nullsec, you get drones. And if it goes to lowsec, then you get Edencom forces based on where geographically it is. So if it's like in Kaldari, you get a Mar and Kaldari rats streaming in the system. If it's in you know, Galente space, you get Galente rats streaming into the system. So there is an advantage for having different you know, connections. So you can get different drops of loot, you know, different types of modules and things like that. But it is quite strange knowing that all doors open inward to Pachvin. We found one ever roaming wormhole that exit outwards, and I think it was an X450 that goes to Nullsec. So that's the only one we found, and we don't know if it's a bug or not. The other thing is, is it creates a dungeon around them that you drop at like 70 kilometers, 80 kilometers away from the wormhole itself, and you have to make your way up through the throng of ads coming out of that wormhole to get to it. So that poses a significant disadvantage to anyone trying to use the wormholes. There are ways to kind of cheese it where you have to go to like a celestial on the opposite side and warp to it at 70 or things like that. You can do those types of things, but it's not always available. You're not going to be able to do that every time. Um, Exo, um, we have a, in wormhole space, we have the drifter wormholes already that have essentially a dungeon surrounding their entrance and exits. Are not sorry, not the exits, but the entrances from K space into um, the Drifter wormholes. Do you have any idea why CCP would uh, introduce that on the connection into Poshven? Um, my suspicion is it's probably for similar reasons. So Drifter holes, uh, I think Drifter holes. Uh, the wormholes are kind of set up that way to make them cumbersome to use. Uh, they're intentionally a bit annoying to have to try to move fleets through and a, a bit annoying to try to roll them. Uh, because with so many connections getting you everywhere, I think that if they just let you land at zero and made it you know, nice and easy to roll those things, uh, drifter hives would quite possibly be pretty game breaking. In fact, some people already argue they're still game breaking even in their their current, uh, you know, in the, their current implementation. If you scan out an entire drift hole or scan out several drifter holes, you have access to practically the entire galaxy if you have the the know-how to get all of those pieces put together into one map. Um, I suspect that they wanted moving into and out of Poshvin to be challenging. Um, they don't want you to just be able to easily roll those wormholes off. They don't want it to be too easy to move fleets in and out. Um, Especially given, you know, some of the stuff that we'd already discussed about the logistic possibilities about how e if you can move within Poshvin, how easy it is to very quickly cross the galaxy using uh, using the, the extract filaments. So I suspect they're trying to make sure that 
it's not too easy, especially for large groups, to reliably be using to teleport fleets across the whole map. Um, and I also think that, you know, that NPC challenge, uh, it's probably not fun. And it's very, if it continues to really be really, really hard, I think we'll really get to see if it was CCP's intention. Because right now, from talking to some people and from the one time I ever went into, into Trig Space, I think they might have overdone it on the difficulty to success to safely move any ships through those wormholes. But, um, so I, as someone living in there, I actually disagree with that. I really like the way that the wormhole mechanics are working right now in terms of the ads spawning out of them. I just don't like that they all open inward because what's happening is people on the outside are now determining, oh, that's a trig wormhole because if they land on grid when they're cloaked, it's not opening the K162 on the other side. I don't know if that's intended, but it's really strange because then they go, oh, that's a trig wormhole. I'm not going to open that because then people are going to, like, triggers are going to pile through and we're getting choked out inside because we actually, can't scan out because there's th no exit. Th there's that. That's actually a, um, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that's actually a wormhole mechanic anyway, where the it, if you don't warp to it, uh, it won't actually spawn a K-162. Well, no, they can warp no, to it. You can that's warp to thing. it. As you're cloaked, if you're cloaked, it doesn't open the other side. If you warp to it and cloak, and you're cloaked the whole time, it won't open for some reason. We don't know if that's intended or not. Okay. That's very strange. So to, be, so to be very clear, what's happening here is that this site is basically modeled off of the old major conduit or field base, if you want to call it that. And the way these things work is that when you land, it starts basically a starting activity. And in the in major and minor conduits and stuff, basically after 10, 20 seconds, the hole opens and rats start spawning. Well, in this case, that hole isn't just a spawner for rats. It is the wormhole itself. So if you warp to the site, you'll just see the Rakavine all around and, and the whole site ready to go. But until it detects somebody decloaked in the system, the an the actual like animation, the, the event that causes the wormhole itself to open doesn't happen. And therefore, the wormhole doesn't open. Yeah, we can actually see there's invisible beacons on it too, which is quite funny. Um, and there's waves that escalate as you fight those rats coming out of those, and they can go all the way up to supercarriers. So we've killed drone supercarriers in there, which give you 0 0.002 standing and no loot. <laughs> oh, they <laughs> give loot. Them. Yeah, the, the loot is less than a drifter cruiser. So That's true. The, dr the drifters are the ones that you really are scared of. They're actually quite nasty. So wow. here's a yeah. thought. Here's well, a thought. The the, the wormholes spawning in the way they do, where external people coming and dictate how they spawn, that wouldn't be an issue if people actually wanted to jump them. Currently, people log in, they see this shiny new content CCP have added to the game for players and gone, I don't want to engage in this content because it sucks, and then they're not opening the wormholes. I feel like that's an issue with the design. Rather, I, that's an issue with the design of the content itself rather than an issue of how the wormholes not, spawns. So I, well, I, from I their perspective not true on that. I think it's a little disingenuous. When people aren't opening them, it's because the tricks come through and bash your structures. And people yeah, have been that, talking to me saying, thing, I'm not right? opening this because it's am... killing my stuff. Let me ask you a question. I have positive Triglavian standings. I have plus 5.5 .5 trick standings. And I spend all day killing drifters and sleepers. So why do tricks come in and shoot my structures? And I can't defend against them because I have positive trick standing and I don't want to wreck my standings. So thankfully, I have, I have alts that I don't care about their trick standings that I use to clear them out. But it just, from a law perspective, it doesn't make any sense. And from a game design perspective, it doesn't make any that sense. Because weird. it's a, it's akin to frigate holes where a PvE player would you Sorry, my voice choked up a bit there. It's akin to frigate holes where a PvP player logs in wanting to engage in EVE Online that day. They see a frigate hold, they think, oh, I'm not going to run today because that's a big risk to me, and they log out. This is that same issue amplified where a PvE player logs in, sees this drifter wormhole, and thinks sees the new Triglavian wormhole, sorry, and thinks it's going to be a pain to roll because my rollers will land 70k off and I shouldn't really defend myself against the rats because as long as the wormhole is still there, the rats will keep escalating up to, you said, super carrier value on the drone side. I'm not sure what it is on the trick side. So Trigs only go to subcap. They're yeah. really annoying, but... But yeah. they will keep respawning. So, the, so as a wormhole resident, the intelligent decision that I can make is to log off and to wait for it to despawn and then to play EVE the next day. It act the mechanics of these new wormholes actively encourage wormholers to not play the game when they see them. That's why I'm finding it quite difficult to hide my disgust for this particular feature because it's really anti-intuitive. And it's another big one on the pile of screwing over wormhole players recently, if you pardon my language. 
The well, thing that's interesting, though, well, is for us, it's one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? Like, when a wormhole connection opens, we want to go through that and kill all your stuff because you're in a wormhole. And it's kind of interesting. Well, and the go ahead and attacking it, you know? come like, through and kill my stuff. The, 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 you should be killing my stuff, not the NPCs. There's a, it should be your side, Yeah, there's another problem. But there's no it, difference. Though. It's that yeah, there can't. is. No, wait, no, it's, no. The other problem is that we can't because the drifters come through our side and they wreck us. They're so strong. Yeah. Yeah, like we were, we were holding the drifters for like less than a minute in order to distract them long enough to be able to sneak things in and out of the wormhole. I, but, I think it's weird that both sides of the wormhole have fleets. That are the wrong way around. I think like, they're the wrong way around. If we, if the wormhole opens in, then there shouldn't be a trig fleet going through and invading the other side. It should only be a fleet coming in one side. Like it makes no sense that there's drifters camping one side and trigs camping the other, but they're not fighting each other. <laughs> You know yeah, what honestly so you, would be you know what would make it better? The same invasion mechanics that we've had the whole time. That tug of war. If we land on that grid and we fight some kind of a fleet and we push a timer or a bar up to the top, then they should start piling out that side and we should have protected the wormhole and it's a trig wormhole now. Same thing can go for the people on the other side in the J space connection, right? Yeah. They just go to the wormhole and they fight trigs coming through and then they push the bar to the other side. There They're are not ways gonna to fight trigs that... coming through. They'll just log off. Yeah. Hey, hold on. Uh, Cap, go ahead and jump in. So you've you've got at the moment you've got trigs on the not trig side and you've got not trigs on the trig side, right? Would yes. it not make more sense that you have not trigs on the not trig side relevant to the area of space that they're coming from and trigs on the trig side and then what you no, have No, because they're invading is... each other's space through the wormhole. Yeah, That's yeah, the whole yeah, point. Wait, trigs wait, are going through wait, the wormhole into the and it, then and then you and then you get the NPC invasion, so you actually have a running battle on one side of the hole or the other, which you as the trig oriented players can join in on your side to push it into the other side, and you know, I as say the wormholer can join in on, on, on my side and try and basically clean it up on my side. So you then have like both sides of that wormhole then have agency over who they want to shoot to get it to go away and you have content on both sides never mind that you can then have players cross jumping and fighting on either side yeah that's what i was talking about is having some kind of a conflict where we could push the hole in some way and have it work but as it stands it's just drifters come through and make it impossible for us to use the hole and trigs come through the other side and make it impossible for them to use the hole so it's just a spawner basically at that just yeah, the majority I... of wormhole players they, they move in there to pvp against each other we don't want to like, we fight NPCs for ISK, we don't want to fight NPCs as part of some sort of emergent content thing. Like I said earlier, we want the players to be the main characters in the stories that we create in Wormhole Space. Makes sense. This is just forcing the NPC content on us that most of us have already made the active decision to not participate in, by most of Wormhole Space not participating in the invasion at all. Well, so, first of all, Wormhole Space has been complaining, a lot of Wormholers have been complaining about having a lack of uh, content being brought into them, and I've had many of them uh, lament the fact that invasions has not touched wormhole space at all. Um, I know a lot of wormholers that are in wormholes in order to engage in PVE. And the idea behind this is, is that like, it is a different opportunity because the, within these Triglavians, when you destroy them, they actually give a different kind of resources. So, um, I mean, like I would encourage people to see it as a, like, Wormhole life should be, in my opinion, and this is from a person that has not lived in wormholes successfully for very long, uh, should be about, like, what is the thing that's going on today? Every day could be something new, and now it's just something new could be our our house is under attack. And at least this tells you that, that there's nasty stuff coming through. I, I Again, I... I I definitely see where you're coming from. I want to emphasize that my issue isn't with new, unique content in wormhole space, and it's certainly not with you guys having the opportunity to come in and invade. Non-consensual PvP is a cornerstone of EVE, and giving you guys opportunities to do that is a good thing. What I don't like is the non-consensual PvE part of this, where we are forced to either deal with, deal with the rats or to log off. I, that's the bit that I don't like. I love that you guys have opportunities to invade wormhole space. I dislike that if neither side engage, then the NPCs just do their own thing, reinforce structures, prevent the wormhole from being used in general. This is the part that I don't like. I, I don't know. I, I feel like the uh, the argument against uh, non-consensual PVE has come up several times in the last couple of years, and it's always 
in my opinion, sort of shot, fallen short, given the fact that non-consensual PVE, as it were, has been like has has been stitched into Eve uh, in various ways. So I don't know. Uh, it's it's a complexity. It would be it would be again. I think that the most important thing here would be uh, what I'm hearing is that there's no feeling of counterplay, which is what you were talking about earlier, Maldavius. When somebody doesn't yes. feel like there's counterplay, then they feel like it's BS, right? If there's somehow that you could feel like you've made progress against the pushback by holding the hole or or like if every time you run a uh, run uh, a wave it spawns a wave on the other side haha -ha, screw you uh as a mechanic then that's one thing um i i do want to say that like for a lot of this conversation about these wormholes uh again i want to like look at it from what a loyal triglavian would see it as in a few months right first of all when you get to the wormhole, those rats that are on the outside are blue to you. It's the first sign that you're home, right? There's somebody there that will protect you because these guys are not only neutral to you, but they will rep you and they will defend you. So if you're being chased, the rats will actually assist you, which makes it easier to get into these systems as a Triglavian than it is as a non-Triglavian who has to deal with the Triglavian rats. Whereas on the inside, what I see this as is that this is the primary content in Poshvin, people have been saying that there's no sites. What I suspect is going to happen is, effectively, these wormholes are going to be identified within Poshvin, and fleets are going to form in order to grind these wormholes. And there are payouts, basically per wave, more or less, that are provided uh, with standings bonuses, at, in the same way that you would expect, like grinding on a major conduit or some other site like that, in in the old days. But the difference here is. Those quote unquote PVEers are also gate camping a real wormhole. And so, in essence, you actually throw away the idea of PVE and PVP completely and just say, I roam around, uh, uh, roam around Poshvin and kill any intruder, any intruder. And it doesn't matter what comes through the wormhole, I'm still going to shoot it. I mean, I guess that makes sense, but at the same time, I find that there is a significant lack of counterplay on those wormholes. Like, I find that there's not a lot that players can do that affects them. Like, we could sit there and grind on the wormhole all day for hours a day, and, you know, nothing will actually happen until that wormhole closes. I wish there was some kind of game mechanic that was engaging for us to be doing those things, because the payouts aren't that amazing, the loot is okay, and there's nothing for the wormholer, like the wormhole side of it, you know, people living in J-Space doesn't do anything for them. It's just more of a nuisance for them. And for us, it's just more of a nuisance for us because we get a bunch of drifters pouring into the system. There needs to be something there that we can do to change the wormhole or take it over or something. There has to be some kind of counterplay. It's just, think, as it is, no control. It's just boring. Clearly, we all just need to sit back and wait for the next chapter yeah. where we can also side with the drifters. <laughs> I think this is, but, but like this, the, the I think the, the, the sort of the ideas that Mal Davis and, and I have both been pushing forward are very much along the same lines, that there needs to be like a, uh, effectively a running battle on at least one side of that wormhole, if not both sides, and that the player can then, from whichever side they wish, engage in support of whichever side they wish. So exactly as uh, as you were saying, Ashtarothi, where you um, you as the, the Triglavian aligned player, you then uh, turn up at this wormhole and you see a, effectively a running battle between you know, Triglavian NPCs and, I don't know, uh, say it's a wormhole, so it's going to be drifters, you can join in on the Triglavian side and you can fight that and then once you've kind of like pushed them you you know killed them out and maybe they have like a, a kind of a retreating pattern which is coming into the sort of tug of war that Mal Davis was talking about you can then take the fight to the other side if you want or you can kind of consider that fight won because you've pushed everything to the other side um you know and then go about your day simultaneously on the other side the wormhole like, pve oriented player can um can join in on whichever side. In in fact, in most cases, because all the all the NPCs, uh, or almost all the NPCs in one more space are drifters and sleepers, they would probably also be joining in on the Triglavian side. But they would have a way of resolving the NPC fleet on their side of the wormhole. And so, say they clear all the drifters out, and then the drifters disperse, and the Triglavian uh, NPCs can then pull back into Poshvin. So and I then think we have important. access to the hole and don't have yeah. to worry about and our holes getting blown up. It's very important you know? have that you have that dynamic where the player can engage with the mechanic to 
drive towards an outcome that they wish for and that engagement can be active or it can be passive and at the moment on the wormhole side it's very much kind of it's a passive response that's you just okay right uh, i'm just gonna treat this like a frigate hole and hope it goes away soon yep and that's it that's is the thing is there is no active engagement for us there's no outcome that we can push for and this entire invasion event has been completely opposite that you know we go to systems we push them to final liminality the system permanently changes and it joined Pashvin. there's so many other mechanics that have worked throughout this invasion where the player changes something in eve forever and that's amazing like that's what eve is about is changing things forever you know like something happens it becomes part of the history of the game and what we're seeing inside of Pashvin is none of that and i'm hoping that it comes but we don't have any ownership over any of this stuff right now Exo, um, why do you think that uh, CCP has been kind of directing their focus more on, I guess, what everyone here is kind of consensually saying is uh, passive style um, game design and gameplay, um, and even 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 more so, it's kind of like um, uh, everyone's saying forced PVE in a lot of respects. Why do you think that uh, that seems to be CCP's like fallback almost? I guess, what, what do you mean by passive game design? Um, I don't know if anybody can kind of uh, comment on that a little bit more. It's kind of a, a ride-along experience, I think, is kind of what the, a common thread that, of a lot of what we've discussed. Like, there is a thing that happens, and you, at the moment, and I, I think that there is a lot of potential for it to not be, and yep. some of which we've discussed, but at the moment it's like you engage in a ride-along experience, it happens, and you can kind of get on and off the train, but it's going to where it's going, and you don't really have any control over where it's going. I think that one of the things that CCP has been doing with, with a lot of Invasion, and we've kind of seen it a lot over the last year or year and a half, really, is ever since they, they began pushing real hard at pulling in new players, uh, some some feedback that CCP gets from people that come into Eve is they can't they're having trouble finding the story or they're having trouble finding the narrative um, because for new players the the whole like the story is the players doesn't quite always pan out the way that you want it to um, yeah. it can take a lot of people a little while before they've kind of either gotten into the right groups made the right friends or discovered how you know, that always, I mean, it's one of Eve's, you know, biggest, you know, monikers. But I think that a lot of, um, I think a lot of the latest stuff they've been building has been kind of built to help there. You know, it's, I guess, uh, <clears throat> you know, even the entire invasion was, was kind of passive in that there was never a chance that Eden Khan was going to win the fight. The, from the moment this whole storyline was conceived, Poshvin was always going to be created. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, which 27 systems it was might have been in players control, but it was almost always going to happen. I don't I don't think that CCP at any point ever created a, a contingency in which the Triglavians just got pushed out. Um, and so, like, they have this story and this narrative and they just try to build it into the game. And what that means is there's things that are going to happen uh, and continue regardless of what the players end up doing. And so for long term Eve players, I think it's it's natural to kind of have a dislike. Well, why couldn't we have done this or why couldn't we, you know, why couldn't we stop this from happening? It's clearly got forced through. But for people that needed that tug or the CCP is really trying to entice or attract the story moving along, I think is very interesting because, um, you know, for years, CC, uh, Eve's lore and kind of like story actually felt like it was like sitting sideways. Like, they keep teasing stuff, but they really, really did a poor job of moving it along. Um, and so I think, you know, on one hand, it's great that I think we've finally seen, you know, the invasion has finished. We got to see a, you know, multi-year story arc come and go. Um, and they actually finished all of it without, like, wandering off and getting distracted by something shiny over there. Um, 
but it's always going to leave a little bit to, to, for, to be desired, I think, from people who come to EVE wanting different things. Because, you know, there's people in this room that have very strong feelings and opinions and interests in all of the lore. And I think there's some people right in this group we have right here that could give two shits and they're only concerned with how this has impacted the way they play EVE. I, I think, um, just kind of responding to what you were saying about, like... A lot of what you've talked about is overarching story and like, narrative direction. And I think I would say that la largely I agree with you that um, having these kind of uh, these sea change uh, movements of the NPC factions and the sort of the, the tapestry of the Eve story is very important. Um, I think the like my where I see the was characterized as passive game design being more problematic is um, in, in for example this this kind of wormhole the lack of this agency the, the the push and pull it's in the the kind of the small scale like single player experience that I, I I want there to be more agency I think having less agency of the overall story is is quite acceptable because Obviously, those things have to be scripted out and designed, as, as was the case with Boschman. You can't just say, okay, well, our players uh, killed the Triggs too too well, and, and we're going to have to scrap this entire like year of dev time. That's just not viable, kind of real-world company level, not viable. But what you can do is you can say, okay, right, well, we've the story has progressed, and we have now this new backdrop, this new canvas to, to, to kind of paint on. And, and now what we're going to do is we're going to paint in this sense of agency in these micro narratives like oh this you know today five wormholes spawned in in my border system like of my clade in Poshvan and I fought with the Triggs against uh, against some rogue drones because that was we, where we connected and then the next hole was a drifter hole and we had this kind of battle across you know both sides of a wormhole and then some guys on the other side of the wormhole it was their home system and they joined in and then we had a fight with the players as well you know you, so you, you you can have both I think is kind of really what I'm trying to say I I largely reject the idea that it was a foregone conclusion uh, for several reasons. Um, I mean, the first of all, uh, you know, you, it harkens back to years ago when the Dust 514 event occurred in which they destroyed the uh, the Titan uh, uh, in um, Galente Prime, or above Caldari Prime, rather. Um, that was a pre-scripted event. It did not matter what the players did. In fact, during that event, it seemed to be going the other way, and they brought in NPCs and they forced it to go the way that it was going to go, right? In previous events, the the, the results was foregone. In this case, if there wasn't a team of Triglavian, pro-Triglavian people to do this, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the, the Serenity side of things, most of the uh, Serenity guys when pro Edencom, which is why we got so many fortresses from uh, from massive fortifications and basically no massive invasions to give us final liminalities. So without these dedicated people who put in hours and hours and hours, when when Edencom went to bed and they grinded it through, like those people earned those systems. And had they have not done so, it could have very easily had not ended up with 27 systems if if people hadn't engaged with it. And to the question of what would have happened then, well, that's really simple. I mean, you're a game developer that are building tools, tools to do things, right? So Poshvin is an example of what those tools could be built. You know, being able to rearrange what systems are connected to what and how, and changing the status of systems and all this stuff, which is what the tools that they were building was for. But if the results didn't lead up that way, they would have had to do something else with it because Poshvin wouldn't have been established. So I, I, I resoundly reject this notion that the 24-7 systems was an inevitability or something, or that somehow CCP put weight on the scale. Uh, the only excuse that I'd ever heard is that they made it so that multiple liminal systems were being attacked at the same time so they couldn't defend anywhere, which in, to me just smacks of somebody who's complaining that they lost, you know? I, yeah, I, I people worked really hard to get these systems. Yeah. I think that's one of the things is like there was a lot of smack talk on both the Triglavian and the Edencom side about there being some kind of, you know, 
foot on the on the scale there from CCP. But in reality, both sides were pushing really, really hard. And in the systems that we won, we outmatched them, either through sheer numbers and force or through tactics on how to actually beat the PvE related system. You know, learning about how to lock down all of the roaming fleets, learning that doing sites in a particular way at a particular speed will actually increase the bar faster. We did a ton of testing and science on all of this to make sure that it would actually go our way in those engagements. And some of it leaked out to Edencom and, you know, some of those systems, they absolutely trounced us on it. Our only hope, like honestly, our, our big thing that we always wanted to do was Niarsha. And we won that. And that was the big one for all of us. For many of us, that was the end of the war for, you know, and we didn't care after that. And then it was like, well, let's just take whatever ones pop up now. I but think that, sorry, carry that, on. That kind of change that we can affect where we say, Jita is not the trade capital of the universe anymore. The idea that we can do that, that we can make that harder was very, very compelling for a lot of our players. And also for the idea of saying, we're taking this from Concord. We don't want this system to be high sec anymore. We don't want players to have to deal with Concord anymore. That was really compelling as players. To respond to Ash, to, uh, Ash sorry, I'm, I keep doing that. To respond to Ash's comment about it being inevit about it not being inevitable, we don't know that for sure. Like if both us and Serenity were pro Eden combo, like until I hear something from CCP, I honestly think that maybe they would have just scaled up the liminality until it was impossible to defend like we can't know either way maybe maybe but the point is, the is that nothing happened them. nothing happened to do that like, i would was... think that nothing happened to do that because it, it's my opinion and i can't prove this just as you can't prove your side i think that nothing like that happened because nothing like that needed to happen because you guys were putting in the work like that's right. honestly but to suggest I that it was CCP inevitable i feel is disingenuous i think it's a possibility that neither side can prove right or wrong that's the reality and there were definitely okay well not definitely but i've been told by somebody who lived in canola before it was turned into final liminality that nobody really fought over it and the triggs just sort of won that system maybe you guys can tell me otherwise whether yeah, so canola specifically what we found is that the triggs were actually outmatching certain of the factions actual yeah, troops Kaldari, in right? those systems and yeah they were absolutely outmatching the Kaldari, but in the amar systems it was reversed the amar ones were absolutely destroying the treglavian so there was imbalance between those so some of those systems did push on their own so if they'd if if they had scaled up enough then some of the, then you wouldn't have been able to cut then pro Eden Comp wouldn't have been able to cover all of them and some of them would have gone in their own assuming there's no pro trick whether ccp would have scaled up that much or not neither of us can say whether they do that until we hear a word from ccp on it so arguing either way as a certainty is disingenuous okay but i was responding originally to people several people stating it as if it was just a matter of fact and i just don't agree with it no like and you're absolutely I... you, you're right in disputing that but um it, neither, neither side, as a matter of fact, until we hear the word from CCP. That's fair. I would just say that, like, in actuality, there was no mechanics that I witnessed that legitimately made it so that one side had an advantage over the other. There was, at first, uh, like, the original design of it actually had uh, systems able to go fortress that could not go final liminality as a way of uh, making it more confusing to figure out which systems the trig wanted to attack. But part of what happened, actually, was we solved the problem of understanding which systems the Triglavians would be interested in before invasions actually even started, which, which they expected that to take a little while. And so they had to change some of the stuff midway. But other than that, I didn't see any like tipping the weight on the scale or, or whatever. In fact, uh, the Kaldari rats got a pretty significant buff, uh, insufficient, but significant buff halfway through along with the uh, Amar rat nerf. Yeah, they did try to rebalance it, and I think that was a good choice because the scales were really tipped heavily on a number of those systems. Like, the Amar rats were just trucking the Triglavians. So you would go and push a system, we'd have all the Trigs in one system pushing it, and two others would fall to Edencom because, you know, the, the rats were just outmatching them. And they knew that. Like, people figured that out pretty quickly, and they're like, oh, we don't have to push that one. It'll push on its own because the rats, you know. I'm going to let Cap jump in here real quick uh, to finish out this thought, and then uh, I've got a couple of questions to... I'll pass around the room. Uh, which, sorry, which sort am I finishing up? Oh, I thought, I thought you were uh, going to jump in on this. It seemed like you were trying to. Oh, well, I, yeah. I mean, my my take on it is if you take all of the players out of the equation, would it, it's kind of like the hacker's paradox, right? You, you have a defender who has to cover every 
every defense and you have an attacker that only has to win one attack at a time. So I think just like looking at how that would play out absent of players, I would expect there to be some level of inevitability unless because without the, so no players, no buffs or nerfs to any of the NPCs, like you would have ended up with a lot of Kaldari systems in Poshman, right? Yeah. Because the color I think that's entirely fair. Really weak. Yeah. Um, uh, so it, it's just like I kind of think it's it's an interesting set of hypotheticals for us to consider, um, but I think that um, like the the original point that I thought we were trying to get at around uh, you know passive or not design like big stories that you can involve yourself in to a degree and. I mean, you can design a story such that the players can become the main agent in it, but if the players don't step up, the story can still progress, I guess is is, the, is how I would express my position on how things went. I think just like the practical limits of we have designed this thing, like we have some call of this dev time, which has a real money cost associated with it. Like it yep. would have come in some form just like on that hard reality. But I think that what happened is that the players took the agency and made it happen their way. And I think that was the best outcome that could have happened from a kind of, I have created a thing and want to let it play out. Like So it, it was the case that the players really fought hard over particular systems. And, and you know, as a point of pride, the trig took Niaja, you know, and the Edencom uh, groups, I imagine, have their own systems that they were really, you know, particularly after Niaja felt really um, invested in, in keeping but I think that that it has been built necessitates that it happened what happened was that the players ended up becoming the main vehicle by which it happened which I think is the best you can ask for I, I think it's kind of similar to kind of what we touched on, talked about uh, you know or earlier about the capitals and the structures in in Poshvin that uh I think what CCP is learning is they need a direction. Um, the you know if it's it's all it's great to just say we're just going to build this and see what the players do with it and emergent gameplay is awesome and creates lots of great stories. But at some point, it can also be an immense pain from a game design and game balance perspective. So I think I guess the answer is I've thought on it more to your original question of like why is some of their game design feeling like it's passive or like there's always a direction. I think that's because it, that's exactly what it is. Everything CCP is doing is they know where they want to take it. There's just a little bit of exactly how we get there. Maybe it's up to some of the players, or this or that is is, is up for grabs. But uh, you know, they, they have a very clear dis, dis, uh, decision that they've made, and this is what we want this to be. Uh, because when they don't have answers, you run into problems. Um, when CCP doesn't know what something is supposed to be, it makes it infinitely harder for them to have productive discussions, um, you know, on how on how to fix something. Because you know, uh, 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 one of the biggest pitfalls we fell into frequently, in, you know, in like the meetings rooms on the CSM, was when players would bring up and say, "This is broken because it doesn't work the way it doesn't work X." And as soon as there's no actual, how is this supposed to work? It just becomes a bunch of people shouting at each other, and CCP can't weigh in because they don't have the answer either. Um, which means at some point they'll make one, but it guarantees when they they go into that situation that they're going to end up making players unhappy because some players like this some players don't and they're going to say okay well we're gonna this is how it's actually supposed to work so bam done um which, which is why i think learning from that they're trying to avoid situations like that as much as possible so like being teed up for t3c round so um i would this actually kind of segues into um uh, my next point that i wanted to talk over so trig invasions have been largely accused all across uh, New Eden of disrupting uh, logistics. Ob you know, the most obvious one was the Niarja um, thing. But now, you know, we're seeing some fallout from and now that uh, we, you know, we're in the final chapter of the Triclavian invasion. Now we're seeing a lot of fallout um, from the leftovers from the minor victories on both sides, the most Edencom and um, Triclavian. Um, so 
you know, uh, wormholers, I think, have especially seen this um, in recent times. Lorseco, can you kind of explain some of the issues behind uh, behind the logistical issues? Yeah, to explain the logistical issues, I just need to get everyone on the same page of what our content is like as a traditional Wormhorn Corp. And by traditional, I mean not a null static corp like captators or like uh, C2 nullsec dudes. So what we do is when you scan out a wormhole chain, there's usually not much content to be found in that chain just because wormhole space isn't that populous. So what you end up doing is finding particular hotspots of content like people's homes, uh, big wormholes with, with structure timers, that sort of thing. And you will leave a scout there. And then on the day that the content's gonna happen, we will scan out our home chain Whoever left the scout will scan out that chain and then we'll meet in the middle, usually through HiSec, and then we'll burn a fleet and participate in the content. That That is our day-to-day -day in wormhole space, especially in high class. We can't really do that as effectively as we used to, specifically because of Niaja disappearing and cutting HiSec in half. That's been such a huge impact on us. On average, I would say it takes us 60 to 90 minutes longer per fleet to get around because of Nia because of losing Niaja. And then on top of that, uh, minor liminality systems not being clearly marked anywhere is really, really frustrating. And that's just a usability thing that I really hope CCP fixes. Um, they do give you the option to opt out of minor liminality and uh, Eden Comm systems on the autopilot, but the majority of our players are neutral and don't care about the Eden Comm systems, and we only want to be able to filter out one or the other. It just that's a usability thing that they can fix but Niaja in particular cutting high second half like that it just makes the game less convenient I have this so, thing when I talk about game balance thing there's challenging gameplay and then there's inconvenient gameplay we, we want more challenging gameplay and less inconvenient gameplay and CCP when they make these sorts of changes they keep put, they, they keep going in the inconvenient direction and it just makes people angry and that's where a lot of the anger from wormholes has come from especially around Niaja I'm, I don't uh, you said you can't see minor victories on the map. Like, there's a map option for that. Does it, so you, it used to come up. Oh, on the you can now as filter as for both Triglavian and Edencom minor victories individually, I believe, and they fixed fortresses. That? They've added the yeah, yeah. That was part of the potion okay. update. Also updated them. when they made it so that it no longer like shows it on your autopilot. It's now visible on the map as red dots, and they're selectable individually. So you could just Under, select Edencom activity. Yeah. Yep. Okay, can the last time, get, the last time I like opened it was just one. Arrow, so. down arrow, like we used to have just up arrows for the triangle systems. Can we get like an up arrow for trig systems and a down arrow for Eden Comp systems so you could just look at your autopilot and just be like, okay, yep, I'll accept that. Yeah, being able to trig that, that I would like. I have to yeah, risk, it's, you know. it's a slightly it's different thing. It's such an like... easy UI element. I would argue that the trig lobbyists should be pointing down, but otherwise I like okay, it. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. And it's worth saying for the record, like this is way off topic, but the things like metaliminal storms as well, it just it just makes sense that those sorts of things that actively disrupt your play should should be very visible. I shouldn't be having to check the map that regularly, especially when I'm I'm plotting a route through Highsec and half half the time before before invasion started, I would just autopilot that because I don't really care. It's just travel. It just it's just less convenient so I, I, and... I will I do want to just chip in at this point and say from the perspective of like a 2006 player like I, I remember freighter convoys out through syndicate to get to out of ring so like I agree that there's like a, a level of convenience um, and a, like a, a, a frustrating kind of gameplay around inconvenience but I think that uh, if correctly tuned, there is opportunity for uh, a content of that nature, like a a convoy-like experience. It just has if. to be designed for the modern, like, Eve. I, I do have this, like, bridges. I do have this, like, fascination or this idea, like, this fantasy of, of this idea of, like, a DST and some uh, es escorts that jump into Poshvin have to navigate several systems and then extract out in order to move things around. So you actually have these like fully chained logistical operations in and out through using Postfin as a major conduit. I have a quick question uh, for Exo. Um, do you believe that uh, time sinks like logistics disruption and um, 
other like even NPC like what we discussed earlier NPC grinds and stuff like that. Do you believe these tine sinks to be a primary or a secondary like game design element that CCP is attempting to do? Uh, I I so I don't think it's a primary design. I don't think you know anyone at CCP at any point ever said let's just make this intentionally time consuming and and and, uh, and stuff i think that ccp would consider making poshvin more dangerous and harder to move around in intentional but it's not their direct intention that it takes forever um because i think most you know we don't things are challenge is good but just because something takes a long time doesn't mean it's challenging which is something that i think uh, you know we've been trying to beat into ccp's head for quite a while um and that they you know they frequently uh, don't understand or seem to to miss the mark with things like making something have a ton of hit points doesn't make it hard it just makes it take a while um oh, and but that's that's a classic failing in like every fucking game ever right that like HP soaks is a massive problem <laughs> in, well, I in, think, in any you know, design. In, in, in a lot of games, the HP soak is in part there because the the other parts of the fight, the boss, whatever you're doing, like other things are also challenging, and so by making it take longer it also increases the challenge because i've got to keep up with those there's a lot of things in eve in which it's not actually hard it just takes a while um that they really frequently get get wrong so i don't think that it's a direct game design to say let's make this uh let's uh you know let's make this take forever like i don't think their game plan was at any point ever by take getting rid of New Year's or we're just going to make everyone take forever. I do think some of those changes are driven at trying to help push alternate plans. You know, CCP is huge on the regionalization thing that we've seen in the resource, the ore distribution, the scarcity changes. They want people to be doing more things locally. So they are intentionally trying to make it harder to base the entire game out of Jita, for example. Like, I can confidently say that it is a specific, maybe not primary goal of theirs, but secondary in some form to make it painful for you to run your organization purely out of out of one point in space. Um, so I disruption think was the goal for sure. Yep, Dis disruption yeah. was, was absolutely a goal. You know, um, they want people to be doing things with the resources they have and only needing to go trade and move around the stuff that they can't get. Uh, whether or not that's painful and a time or waste of time, I think is kind of what CCP says. Well, you chose to make it a waste of time by not, you know, going in other directions. I do like it as well because, to be honest with you, with everything being through Jita, the, you know, needing Kaldari standings is one of the most important things is being a marketeer because you need to drop those prices down. So now with splitting that up as a trade hub, there are other factions that matter more and it drives the game in different directions. That kind of disruption is actually positive for the game and I think it's really good. As somebody who doesn't actually know, has this actually resulted in Amar, for example, becoming a bigger trade hub? I don't know whether yes. it has. It's okay, definitely yes. influenced Dodixie. Yeah, Dodixie is much larger now. Amar has gained. Um, Renz is now being a thing for people who are trading there. Like, it's changed the scope, like, you know, the landscape for actually doing trade and Amar eat. has really gouged prices on some stuff and yeah. lower energy to prices and some other stuff for interest. So, like, I, my, my main market character, which is how I made my music for many years, has always been in Amar because the market has always been slower and therefore it's easier to engage with when you're not logging in every day multiple times a day um, so it'll be interesting to see how that changes so as a game designer one doesn't only develop everything to be positive and fun and roses and, and ego stroking at every single moment in fact a lot of the times what you do is design meaningful challenges to undergo and uh, if anybody, if you've listened to Hilmar or CCB Ghost talk at all in the last two years, you've probably heard them talk about the friendship machine. And this is something that they believe very, very passionately about EVE Online and its ability to build groups of people. And what they know is what it takes is actual adversity, that these challenges 
as much as we don't that they don't feel good in the moment right like the wormhole group that that is totally cut off and you know or the the people that are having to deal with all of this bs and these disruptions and whatnot dealing with these challenges it sucks but dealing with sucky things together is what makes lasting real solid friendships which is the real goal uh, that they're trying to achieve with much of this design the big issue here is that they're not challenges I mean, they're just inconveniences yeah. they're incredibly it's, easy for us to overcome but it just takes us an hour longer every day and we're not building stronger friendships together because some poor sod has to scan for an hour longer we're just all getting frustrated as a collective instead of before where we could just be where we could just get it done so much quicker and just play the video game instead of right click jump stargate for so much longer it's i i i totally agree with you ash that adversity through challenges is great if the gameplay is actually challenging and interesting and engaging a lot of this time just isn't alone isn't isn't like if yeah. i if i'm doing 10 jumps through high sec or i'm doing 40 jumps through high sec like that's not an interesting choice that's not right but the fact that you have to go 40 jumps my gameplay the fact that you have to go 40 jumps because niarja was taken is incidental niarja could have never existed you could have jumped you could have appeared halfway across the yes, cluster yeah, like I, I, yes but i agree but this isn't occurring in a vacuum i, I am i am take i have a status quo and my status quo is it takes me half an hour roughly to get around high sec market hubs and kind of roughly regardless of where i've connected into high sec as long as i've connected not connected into an island and now that has changed from uh to uh having still that short uh, time period if I've, if I've connected somewhere that's, that's more directly useful to being extended by an hour or 90 minutes to come across high sec and that extension isn't giving me any more interesting or more challenging gameplay to experience it's giving me exactly the same gameplay but just four times more of it and you know moving a hauler through high sec isn't really an interesting thing to do there are you know you can you can see this by the the number of uh, freighters and haulers that just stack up on some of the invasion systems because someone has just AFK'd their 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 ship through high sec and it's got to the prompt where it said you know this is a dangerous system at the moment are you sure you want to jump and they've just not noticed. Um, so I think I think, kind of like, I, I think we're talking a lot about the sort of aftermath of these systems, right? But. The thing is, is a lot of stuff in EVE is meant to be a conflict driver. The fall of Niarja was a massive conflict driver. We had like 800 people in system, people fighting on both sides, tons of PvP battles, and it's turned into a huge conflict driver for the time before it went to Poshvin. Trillions of ISK of ships were lost in Niarja. It's actually immensely incredible to me, right? Absolutely awesome. And that conflict driver is what I felt all of this was about up until Poshvin happened. Now that it's been plucked out of the universe, now it feels weird. When it was still a dangerous system, it was something new and exciting and added something interesting to the game. How many of those trillions of ISK do you think were only lost because CCP never fixed the issue when Niaja was considered as high sec on autopilot? Like how many how many the, of those uh, people mindlessly feeding into oh, gate I camps? Know. I just interlocking where post. <laughs> I obviously I, I from my perspective was bitter about Niaja falling because I knew it would impact my gameplay, but I can't argue with the game design around that and the emergent gameplay being a net, yeah. a net positive it was good content what came after and the trillions of us dying just because of an issue that ccp never fixed and then now it's been removed now the content is over i'm just left with this huge gaping inconvenience that's that's where the anger is coming from not so much from me but certainly from a lot of other high sick people who are a lot more mad about it than mm. i am i mean i guess the the only response i have for that is you should have fought for edencom Okay, I could have the system, you know. I could have brought every single corporate. I could have called in all my favors, brought in all of the corporations that I know, got three hundred people on field, and we like lo would have lost to Goonswarm anyway. Like there's okay. there's there's a certain there's a certain level where emerging gameplay is good, but when you open it up to literally anyone, like the out the outcome there was inevitable as soon as Goons picked aside, as soon as Test picked aside, and like I appreciate that. That's how Eve works. I'm not going to complain about that, but. When people tell me, oh, you should have fought for Edencom, I mean, I'm glad I didn't because now I can explore Potchkin because I didn't fight for Edencom and ruin my Triglavian standings. I think so, um, yeah. One, one of the other things that would maybe be a nice refinement that uh, would ameliorate some of the like 
particularly the logistical time costs moving around HiSec, is that um, currently the autopilot basically allows you shorter, um, safer, or you know, avoid X systems. It would be nice if there was um, much like you know, if you put in a a, 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 a set, ask for a set of directions on your phone, you get presented with several options that you oh, you know can see in parallel and are more similar. So, for example, if you want to go from Amar to Cheetah or vice versa, and you put uh, like shortest route, currently the autopilot gives you a monstrously long route. Right, it gives you all the way through like uh, Memetar space into Galen space into Kalara space. There is actually a much shorter route. Uh, that exists that the autopilot will flag up for you if you set the correct waypoint in the in between. Um, now, the problem this has is that it has a single low sec choke in it, and that low sec choke is quite actively camped, um, which I think is is kind of coming to the more interesting aspects of logistics, where you start going, okay, right, well, we have a reasonably short route, but there is a problem along the way, and we're going to have to form a defense to convoy through that particular system, right? Which on an individual level is still a massive uh, obstruction to getting your logistics done conveniently, but on a group level presents you with that interesting adversity and gives you that, okay, right, if we just deal with this thing, we get a nice short route. Currently, however, that route is still really quite long. Um, so it would be nice if the, like, the adversity um, elevated routes between all the high sec hubs were shorter. So we're kind of Amar to Jita while Nayaj are still connected, level short. Whereas at the moment they're still in the sort of 20 to 25 jump length, which I think is, is kind of, that's both doubly long in terms of time cost inconvenience, and it's also um, has this added adversity component that you need to organize to deal with. So I think there are, there are like some tuning issues that need addressing here. So I have a, um, on that note, I have a final question uh, to ponder everyone here. Um, and then we need to wrap up because we're coming up on long time, two hours now. Um, do it's a two-part question? Is first in the current state of um, trig space, do you and do you believe that there is a potential for market trading within uh, trig space, or there to be a, I guess, more of a centralized location um, in its current state? And do you? who believe that there could be if uh, CCP changes the way that standings are gained. So I guess um, what that I guess what that means is is like do you believe do you believe that there's a potential for um, overall do you believe that there's a potential for trig space to be uh, to become a market to replace some of the logistical challenges that uh, Niarja has caused. Malt, I guess I'll direct this at you since uh, you guys are the ones there and probably a little more optimistic about it. <laughs> Sorry, say again. But my mic was cutting out, or my headphones were cutting out. Do you believe that Triglavian Space has the potential to uh, replace the markets and logistical challenges that Niarja and the rest of the final liminality systems have uh, created? As it currently stands, no. Um, I think that if they changed the way that the wormhole mechanics work, there is a possibility for that. But the thing is, is the wormholes are too hard to navigate currently in a way that is cohesive. And because you can't pass through the gates unless you have 3.0 standing, that's all but impossible to really route through. Originally, the way that we saw it was kind of as a subway system where you get in and you can move around and go to different areas, which was quite cool. But if you don't have the standings, you can't really do that. So grinding the standings needs to be fixed before that can be possible. Uh, do you believe at all that CCP will make an effort to try to fix those grinding of standings? Absolutely. I don't doubt that at all. You know, I think that they put a, a massive amount of dev work into here. If you actually look at these systems, there's tons of assets in here that are completely new. There's tons of different things that we've never seen before in EVE. They added all new wormholes to be able to manage this whole thing. I really doubt that they will abandon this place in any way like that. I absolutely believe they're going to evolve on it. I don't think that there's any other you know, thing for that. Plus, there's content that clearly is not open yet, so there's stuff to come. 
I was just going to say, can I just duck in and say, like, a bowhead capable uh, hole, I think is, is a really nice touch. Um, I would argue that uh, bowhead is more similar in size to an orca or in a battleship than it is to a, uh, like a freighter or a, a proper capital ship. And it would be really nice if that 450 million, million mass, uh, minimum mass, migrated its way over to some of the currently 300 million kilo minimum, uh, sorry, maximum mass holes. Because uh, having having bowheads, being able to take bowheads through uh, subcap uh, only holes uh, opens up several really interesting options in terms of being able to. Uh, access content that isn't directly accessible from your home hole. That I'm not that are kind of beyond the scope of this uh, conversation, but are quite interesting. That's a good segue into uh, coming up on time here. Uh, so I'm going to go around the room and get uh, everyone's final thoughts here on what uh, what we think about this uh, content and um, you know what our um, hopes are for the future. So Laura, I actually would like to start with you. Um, my hope for the future for this region is, this is a very selfish view, obviously, because I have a particular vision that I wanted for this region, and that was a place with a barrier of entry sort of in a middle ground between Thera and Wormholz, where a very small, by very small sort of sub-50 man group would be able to move in and then use Nothic films to be able to go and explore and then use, uh... Uh, the inbound Triglavian films to be able to come home and it would become like a more convenient male static experience and my ideas around that region were always around players using the mechanics to go and kill other players the reality of the situation is CCP want it to be a more PvE focused region where the main characters are the Triglavians and the sleepers I just disagree fundamentally on that and I can agree to disagree with that I understand where they're coming from but even the way that those mechanics are implemented, I think, is quite poor right now. As far as iteration goes, CCP have kind of a track record. It's pretty bad with iterating on bad changes. Wormhole Space has gone a pretty bad part of that, where we got a very extensive PvE overhaul in 2016 and had huge issues with it that destroyed Wormhole Space for years and were only fixed this year. So as far as hope for the future, I... I'm a naturally optimistic person, but like, I need to be realistic and base what I think is going to happen on past experiences, and that's I. I don't know whether this is going to be iterated in a timely fashion. I don't know whether you guys are going to learn where this gate in the home system is going to lead. I'm not optimistic for that. I genuinely hope that I'm wrong, and I genuinely hope you guys like get some really exciting stuff. But realistically, I'm not holding out hope. Okay, thank you very much, Ashtarasi. Uh, closing thoughts. It's starting to get loud around here, um, but uh, I'm I am continued to be mindful of like how it's going to be in the future, um, and I'm mostly focused on trying to get uh, as many people like a process to get people that are interested um, able to get engaged with it as as quickly as possible. And I, for one, am looking forward to next week as we get the second phase of trying to make sense of all of this. Already, um, EXO, I actually pass it on to you. What are your thoughts on um, how this is going to go out? What CCP's got in store, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um. Well, I mean, I think something that would be great. I don't know if it'll ever actually happen, but uh, you know, since we didn't get a fan fest this year, and we aren't getting our usual Eve Vegas. Uh, which it's a little hard to imagine where we would be if we were having those. I think it would be great if CCP at some point uh, could share any of their kind of thoughts on what they hoped Poshvin was supposed to be from a, not from an in-game lore perspective, but purely from a, like, why are we adding this to the game? Um, because without knowing exactly what they're thinking, it's hard to give them, their, you know, constructive feedback on whether or not they've actually hit their mark or missed their mark. Because, you know, uh, everybody has their own vision of what it you know what they thought it was supposed to be or what it would be great if it was but it's it's really hard to tell right now what they're actually even trying to do here um i've got a lot of guesses uh but so far i haven't been able to really find a good match because 
you know, of they did this or that. Uh, hopefully they're going to learn quick and iterate. I, you know, I think we hope that on virtually everything CCP ever does. Some things in Potsdam sound like they're working out great and people are having fun, others less so. Uh, other things are seemingly just bugged or not quite finished. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they keep building with it, but I really can't say at this time if what they're building it into is actually something the game needed or is going to be great. Um, but I'll, I'll be optimistic that they'll that they'll head that way. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping uh, to kind of touch on that a little bit. I'm hoping that CCP um, expands the uh, mortal enemy uh, narrative between the Drifters and the uh, the Triglavians because I feel like it was something that they really missed out on um, during the Drifter expansion and. Um, yeah, so hopefully they don't uh, leave it by the wayside. Captain, I mean, I think I don't, I don't think the storyline is going to sit sit idle for very long at all. I have a feeling that we'll be moving into whatever's coming after the Triggs next, and you know, my my lore guess is that the Drifters will be returning. Captator, you got any final <laughs> thoughts? So um, I think like we've we've covered a lot of uh, a lot of the kind of. The, the, the good in that there are some really uh, kind of almost critically important aspects to this this kind of this narrative arc and this expansion and we've also covered how um, there are some there are some gaps there are some bits where it's clearly not quite finished or it's buggy and then there are some bits where it's like maybe they were just gonna let it sit and then try and think about it and hopefully some of what we've said will direct or prompt perhaps some thought if any of the relevant people actually uh, uh, kind of come through and, and listen. Um, I think it's it's really interesting. I think the 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 kind of the idea of some kind of semi enclosed uh, kind of Thunderdome kind of area has like a lot of potential. I think one of the things that CCP have struggled with design wise, particularly on the kind of more let emergent gameplay happen and then try and prune later former style is that there has been um, there's not really been like an incubator type area for small and medium groups to find their feet um, and players have created them in various bits of of, um, of NPC null and also soft null but I think this is to my mind like a very uh, conscious um, conscious like f effort to work in towards that direction and i think that's that's really positive that they they, they clearly are kind of uh, eyes on the prize in that in that particular aspect of the game um, and we've discussed some of the kind of the fallout that maybe needs to be tweaked and considered but yeah I'm, i think as as an outsider i think it's pretty cool um, um, particularly if it gets the, the polish and the, the sort of feature completion that it needs all right and finally moldavius yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this content, honestly. I'm excited to see where it goes. We've invested quite a lot into it, you know, as a corporation. We've invested a lot into it as an alliance just to see where it will go. We bought the ticket that CCP sold us. And my hope is that this ride takes us somewhere that's really awesome. I, I don't know if it will. I hope it does. The rest of the invasion, to me, was quite a lot of fun. There was a lot of cool stuff that got to happen. People got to meet each other. We got to build a faction. We got to make a change in New Eden that can never be undone now. Like, there's a lot to be said about that kind of stuff. But for Poshvin itself, it feels odd right now. And I'm hoping that they do something with it. All right, uh, I am as well. I'm, hope I'm really hoping that they find a good uh, balance between all of the things that we've discussed today and personally I really hope that they find a better way of connecting um, J space with Triglavian space because it's a that is a um, untapped resource that I believe uh, could really open up um, and expand the uh, player interest narrative and kind of expanded universe between wormholes and Trig Triglavian space all right, um, that uh, we're just over two hours now on this uh, conversation. So, uh, first, I wanted to say thanks to everybody who showed up here. Uh, special thanks to Maldavius and Ashtarathi for lending yourselves and your expertise to the show. 
Uh, Ixuki, thanks for uh, coming on and uh, giving your expertise and um, understanding of where uh, CCP may or may not be coming from um, through your experience with CSM. Uh, Captain Laura Seco, always appreciate you guys' input um, for uh, what's going on with wormholes and um, the wormhole community at large. This has been the uh, third episode of the Noikis Connection, going over the Triglavian expansion. Uh, this is Tiberius. Have a good night. <laughs>